Good morning and welcome to worship today. Maybe you sat down here on Saturday night with your iced tea, or maybe it's Sunday morning and you have your coffee in hand. But in any case, we pray you've come to give your heart and spirit to the Lord in worship. And we are glad that you have joined us here in this place for worship. For those of you who can make it, we are having much the same service as you see here, but with live humans doing all but the music on Sunday mornings. So please feel free to join us in our Family Life Center at 1030. If you prefer to worship in Spanish, you can join our Maranatha service in our chapel at 1015. And then in about a month, when we return to something close to our normal worship schedule, you'll be able to choose among four services each Sunday. We're working hard to figure out what church is going to be like in the future, but we do hope you'll be ready to join us in person by summer if you can. Watch your weekly Friday Bulletin email for details, and if you're not receiving that email and you'd like to, check the information at the bottom of your screen now and contact us about that or whatever else you need to contact us about. We'd be glad to hear from you. Today we are continuing our sermon series on the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul wrote, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. This verse is at the heart of our scripture passage from Ephesians 2 this morning. Pastor Don Fitzke will reflect on the implications of being saved by grace through faith in his sermon titled, Gracious, Humble, Grateful, Good. Brothers and sisters of this congregation, whether you are a lifetime member who has been faithful to the church for decades, a newer member looking forward to getting to know everyone as I still am, or a devoted member of our online worship family, we are grateful for all of you. We thank God for the many ways you encourage the ministries of this church by participating in worship here online or at the church, by reading our weekly bulletin newsletter, what we call eBlast, by praying for those who are ailing among us and over the joys of this church family. And with your financial gifts to the ministries, we are still actively pursuing. We are so very blessed by you, each and every one of you, and we praise God for you. Thank you for being part of this little piece of the kingdom of God with us. And now will you join me in prayer so that we may center ourselves for worship. Heavenly Father, it is by your grace that we gather for worship, and it is only by your grace that our lives are changed. In fact, we are counting on your active and amazing grace for our lives today. By your Holy Spirit, Father, will you enliven our worship, inspire us, and then help us by our actions to be faithful followers of Jesus. For this, we give you thanks and praise. Will you now receive our worship, Lord, in the spirit in which we give it? In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about grace. What comes to mind when you think about the word grace? Maybe you think about the prayer you say before a meal. We call that sometimes saying grace. Maybe you think about a friend or family member whose name is Grace. Maybe you think about similar words like graceful or gracefully, as in someone gracefully walked across the room. But today, we're going to talk about a different kind of grace, a more special kind of grace. We're going to talk about God's grace. Have you ever received a gift or maybe someone did something special for you and it was completely unexpected. I mean, it wasn't Christmas, it wasn't your birthday. You were not expecting to get a gift or have someone do something for you. They did that completely out of the blue. Has that ever happened to you before? How did that make you feel? I bet it made you feel pretty good. I mean, when it's Christmas or when it's your birthday or when you're expecting a gift, getting a gift still makes you feel pretty good. So when that gift comes about completely unexpectedly, it's going to feel even better, isn't it? That's what it's like with God's grace, only times about a million. So you're going to feel even that much better. And here's the great part. God gives us this gift every single day. He gives it to you. He gives it to me. He gives it to everyone who follows him. Isn't that amazing? God gives us this amazing gift of grace each and every day. Now, what does that mean? Like, grace isn't something you can touch or hold on to. Grace means that when we mess up, and boy, are we going to mess up, God will forgive us and God will encourage us to keep on the right path. The Bible tells us that God doesn't keep a record of wrongs. God isn't sitting up in heaven keeping track of all the bad things that we've done. When we mess up, but we promise to continue to try to follow God each and every day as best as we can, God wants us to do that. So God encourages us and God forgives us and sets us on the right path again. Friends, this is such amazing news. God's grace is so good and we are so undeserving. There's nothing that we can do to earn God's grace. God wants us to help people and love people and to do good things. But there's not one thing that we can do to actually earn the amount of grace God gives us. This is some good news, friends. It's probably some of the best news, right? God's grace is such a good, good thing, and we are so thankful for it. Will you pray with me? God, you know our human hearts. You know that our tendency is to not always do the right thing, though we try our best to do the right thing. You know that we stumble and you know that we fall. But God, you give us your good grace each and every day and you help us to get up and to get back on that right path. So God, help us to continue on that right path. Help us to continue to do good things in your name, to continue to love others and serve others as you would do. Thank you, God, for your amazing, wonderful, unexpected gift of grace. Amen.
the morning, I'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air. The spirit is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature the children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is in rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly place of Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by the grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of work, so that you may one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for providing for us in more ways than we can ask or imagine. It seems like we've spent the last year begging you to give our doldrums back to us, the things that we thought were so boring before we've wanted, the world we could rely on, good or bad, to be the same over and over again. And here we are on the brink of the end of this pandemic, praying without even realizing it that we can return to the boredom, life without surprises like the ones we've endured for over a year now. Instead, Lord, give us a surprise of your riches, your grace showered on us, and your love inspired in us and through us to be better than we were. Not to return to the same old space, but to come up better for what we have been through. To be richer and happier and more able to see by your saving grace and to see your grace itself for what it is, a miracle of love and faith for our lives and an eternity to do it in. Once again today, Lord, we ask you to heal the people that we love, the ones in pain, the ones who are sick and grieving and wishing for things beyond their control. Give them all a sense of your presence in the place they find themselves on your path to healing even if that healing results in coming home to your plan for their eternity. Give us peace about your will. Help us all to be more like you and to accept what we cannot change. Give us the courage to change what we can and the wisdom to know the difference. Grant us your peace. Lord, in the wake of a court verdict, which has awakened us to the need for change in the way we see the people of this country and the rest of the world, help us, your Christian family, to see only your children, to treat everyone as we want you to treat us, and to know and understand that we need to be part of the solution as we call ourselves yours. Give us just a mustard seed's worth of the grace you've given us to shower onto others. Father, we pray for the ministries of Harmonyville Church in Pottstown this week. May they sense your presence, your will, and your grace and all that they do to minister to their community. Lord, inspire us to live into the grace you freely shower on us, even as we apply it to others in our own lives. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, no more, no less, so that we might learn from that and be better for it. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
On August 5, 2010, a massive cave-in at the San, Ho San Jose Mine in Chile trapped a group of miners underground and began a months-long drama that captivated the world. As an NPR writer described it, a single block of stone as tall as a 45-story building had broken off from the rest of the mountain and had fallen through the layers of the mine, causing a chain reaction as the mountain above it began collapsing too. 33 miners were sealed inside the mountain by this mega block of stone, some 770,000 tons of it, twice the weight of the Empire State Building. Staring at that flat, smooth wall, Luis Urzawa, the crew's supervisor, thought it was like the stone they put over Jesus' tomb. Only a miracle could move it. The heading in my Bible over today's text is uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. That heading reminded me of the dramatic story of the salvation of those miners. The heading was from death to life. If ever there was a group of people who seemed destined to die, but instead received new life, it was that group of miners. Following the collapse, the miners did some exploration and confirmed that there was no way out. 
From the surface would be rescuers explored existing emergency tunnels and ventilation shafts and also quickly determined that the only option was to bore more than a half mile through the ground to try to hit the 540 square foot room where any survivors were most likely to be. Shoddy maps of the underground maze made hitting the right spot a needle in a haystack proposition. And if there were, if there were survivors, there was no way to bore a hole wide enough to get them out before their meager rations would long ago have been exhausted. It was an impossible situation. The miners could not save themselves. And to the people on the surface who didn't even know if they were, they were alive, it seemed like it would take an act of God to save them. Paul talks about people like those miners in Ephesians 2. In fact, he suggests that every person who ever lived is like those miners, desperately facing death and badly in need of deliverance. Paul says that instead of a massive stone wall, what cuts us off from life is our sin. Reading from verses 1 to 3 in Ephesians 2, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Paul is writing to people who now are alive in Christ, those who once lived among the dead and disobedient. They weren't literally dead. They were more like a dead man walking, a term that is used to describe a person who has been sentenced and is on his way to the death chamber. Sister Helen Prejean wrote a book by that title a number of years ago, uh, dealing with the death penalty. The, the dead man walking is not yet literally dead, but the outcome of his life is not in question. James 1, 14 to 15 describes it this way, but one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. In Ephesians 2, 1, Paul says, we were dead through trespass and sin. To trespass is to, is to stray off course and cross a line into forbidden territory. The word translated as sin speaks more of, of missing the mark. John Stott suggests one who trespasses is a rebel and one who sins is a failure. Before God, he says, we are both rebels and failures. Paul reminds the Christians that he is addressing in his letter that they once lived like the rest of the sinful world, influenced by the ruler of the power of the air, that's Satan, slaves to their own passions and desires. They lived like all the other dead people walking. Their present and future looked dark, not unlike those 33 men imprisoned under tons of rock and earth. But the story of those miners wasn't finished. After some initial despair and chaos, the miners agreed to, to make all decisions democratically and they organized their subterranean lives. They, they stretched their meager food rations, which were intended to last only a few days, and they made them last for more than two weeks by consuming two spoons full of tuna, a sip of milk, and a biscuit every 48 hours, along with an occasional morsel of peach. They used truck batteries to light their hard hat lamps and they obtained drinking water from vehicle radiators and other sources in the warm, humid tunnel. As one article described it, they allocated daily tasks and resources, established living and waste disposal areas, and used the lighting system to simulate day and night. As they passed the time by sharing stories about their lives, the bonds among them deepened and they began calling themselves simply the 33. In their grim situation, hope focused on the possibility of rescue and on maintaining their dignity, even if rescue eventually proved impossible. 
family members and others on the surface also sought to maintain hope. They gathered to pray together and support one another in what came to be known as Campamento Esperanza, Camp Hope. Now, without knowing whether anyone was still alive and working against the clock, experts assessed the situation and began boring small holes with a, a diameter less than seven inches. By one person's calculation, the chance that any given drill hole would hit the spot where the miners were was less than 2%. A number of attempts were diverted off course by hard rock. On August 19th, one drill broke into an area where the men could have been found, but they found no life. Desperation was setting in. But three days later, on August 22nd, day 17, just a couple days after the miners' food had run out, the eighth try scored a hit. The miners tapped on the drill bit and the sound of life could be heard on the surface, thousands of feet above. For days, the miners had heard drills approaching and they had prepared notes. And when the drill was withdrawn, there was a note attached to it. It said, all 33 of us are fine in shelter. Now able to get supplies to the miners through the narrow shaft, rescuers redoubled their efforts to bore a tunnel wide enough for rescue. They simultaneously bored three shafts from three directions using three different technologies, not knowing which might be successful. And option B finally broke through. And on October 13th, the 70th day, the last miner was rescued as if from the tomb, as the world looked on in amazement. All 33 once feared dead were saved and the world rejoiced. Picking up at Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 9. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace, in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. You know, when the mind collapsed, there were many things to decide about methods and strategy and logistics. The best minds and the greatest technology were needed to plan and execute the rescue. But the one thing that nobody debated was whether the miners should be saved. As I read Ephesians 2, it seems that God didn't have to spend much time debating whether we were worthy of being saved from the power of sin and Satan. God's very nature made it a foregone conclusion that he would launch a rescue. His plan grew out of his abundant mercy and his great love. Because of who God is, there was no question of his desire and his will to save us when we were dead in our trespasses and to make us alive together with Christ. The mine rescue involved the construction of a, a state-of-the-art capsule that would be used to bring one man at a time to the surface. Just 21 inches in diameter, the capsule was fitted with retractable wheels and oxygen supply, lighting, video, and voice communications, a reinforced roof to protect against rock falls, and an escape hatch with a safety device to allow the passenger to lower himself back down if the capsule became stuck. God's rescue plan for his people involved the crude cross. Before any of the 33 miners were delivered from the mine, first, the experienced rescue expert Manuel Gonzalez was lowered in the capsule into the mine to help set the miners free. Before we could be saved, God sent his son into our world to call us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Manuel Gonzalez risked his life to save the miners. Jesus gave his life to save us. 
reconciling us to God through the cross. Verse 8 includes the, the formulation of salvation by grace through faith made famous by reformer Martin Luther. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Luther objected the Catholic dogma that indicated that we had a role to play in purchasing or earning our salvation, both literally through the, the practice of purchasing indulgences from a corrupt church to offset sins and, and figuratively through our own human efforts or, or works righteousness. His point was that like those miners, we were incapable of saving ourselves and were totally dependent upon God's grace. God would have to take the initiative. Yes, we do have to exercise faith in order to receive God's gracious gift. We need to believe God is able to extract us from the depths of darkness, and we need to climb into the rescue capsule that God provides to set us free. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. I thought about this salvation by grace and and wondered how such grace should impact the living of our lives. And I came up with four ways. Grace makes us gracious. Grace makes us humble. Grace makes us grateful. And grace makes us good. Gracious, humble, grateful, good. First, grace makes us gracious. Grace and mercy are two sides of the same coin. I like to define grace as, as unmerited favor, receiving good things that I don't deserve. Mercy, on the other hand, is not receiving bad things that I do deserve. Now, I think people who have truly experienced the grace of God should naturally be gracious toward others. People who understand mercy, the mercy that God extended to them, should be quick to extend mercy to others. Grace and mercy are transformative. Now, I'm sure I used this example before, but I'm always inspired by the story of Jean Valjean in the show The Miserable. After spending years in hard labor for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family, the embittered Valjean is released from prison and a, a kindly priest gives him a meal and lodging for the night. Well, Valjean expresses his appreciation by stealing the priest's silver and fleeing. The authorities capture him and bring him back to the priest to, to confirm the details of the crime. But instead of condemning Valjean to additional years of hard labor, the priest plays along and claims that he had given the valuables to the thief. To seal the deal, he offered Valjean two additional silver candlesticks. You forgot, I gave these also. Would you leave the best behind? Well, Valjean's life was transformed by this act of mercy and he lived the rest of his life for others, most notably for Cosette, an orphan girl that he raised as his own. People who receive mercy should be merciful. Grace makes us gracious. Next, grace makes us humble. Looking to verses eight and nine again, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. We are saved not by our own doing, not by our own works, not by our own goodness. And therefore, we have nothing to boast about. I mean, doesn't a generous gift say more about the giver than it does about the recipient? Now, perhaps the, the recipient of a priceless gift could take some satisfaction in knowing that they are so special as to be worthy of such a gift. And it is good to have our self-esteem lifted by knowing the value that God places upon each of us. But I don't think it's anything to boast about. When those miners were brought back to the surface after 70 days underground, not one took credit for anything they did to be saved. They hadn't masterminded the rescue. They hadn't dug themselves out with their own effort. They were utterly dependent upon those trying to save them from above and upon God. 
Now, certainly they did some things the right way. They encouraged each other while waiting to be rescued. But, but the main part that they played in their own salvation was that when it was their turn, they climbed into the capsule to be safely transported from death to life. They recognized that their salvation was not their own doing, but was a gift. Nothing to boast about. Grace makes us humble. Third, grace makes us grateful. I mean, how do you, how do you thank somebody who saves your life? First, I think you, you just say, thank you. Often when we think of prayer, we, we quickly move to requests, maybe for ourselves or maybe intercessory prayer for others. And that's all good. God does want us to make our requests known. But I like the ACTS acronym, A-C-T-S, to remind me to include more than just requests in my prayer. ACTS stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. If you listen to my uh, prayers, sometimes when I write public prayers, I follow that formula, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So along with supplication, that's asking God for stuff, we need to praise and thank God. God makes us grateful. Now, sometimes when somebody does something nice for us, we, we wanna express that appreciation by, by paying them. And they might reply, no, no, I don't want anything. I'm happy to do it. Just pay it forward by helping someone else. And I think that's kind of the situation that we're in with God. We can't pay God back for his mercy and grace, but we can pay it forward, expressing our gratitude by being generous toward others with that generosity defined as broadly as possible, generous in sharing money and time and, and the gospel itself. The hymn says, because I have been given much, I too must give. Asked about how he felt after being rescued. One of the Chilean miners pointed to a phrase on his t-shirt. It said simply, thank you, Lord. Grace makes us grateful. Finally, grace makes us good. Now, to be more precise, grace makes us do good. Verse 10, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. That says to me that we are saved for a purpose and the experience of receiving grace should lead us to live what Rick Warren famously calls, called the, the purpose-driven life. We've probably all heard stories of people who found themselves in desperate situations and, and bargained with God. The saying, there are no atheists in foxholes speaks of this dynamic. In our time of need, we, we cry out to God even if we aren't sure that God exists. And, and sometimes we plead, God, God, get me out of this and I will do thus and so. I'll, I'll give up drinking or I'll give my life to Jesus. I'll treat my family better. I'll reorder my priorities. I'll become a preacher or a missionary and go to a faraway place. Now, often foxhole faith is short-lived and many who are spared don't follow through with their pledge to God. But some do. God's grace transforms it. Sometimes people have a, a close call, an accident or, or an incident, that, an illness that, that could have, maybe even should have killed them. And the experience serves as a wake-up call and leads to a reordered life with renewed focus on things that matter. If we take Paul seriously, I think we would understand that each of us has been saved by grace from a near-death experience and have been given the gift of life. We've been saved for a purpose. Grace makes us live differently. Grace makes us good. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Because of God's love and mercy, we have been rescued. Such grace should make us gracious, humble, grateful, and good. Mario Sepulveda was the second Chilean miner to emerge from the mine and was ecstatic to be received by the, the cheering crowd. And 
He summed up his 70 days in purgatory this way. He said, I was with God and the devil. They fought and God won. And that's true for all of us. Please pray with me. Loving God, we thank you for your marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. May that grace transform us to live lives that are gracious, humble, grateful, and good, so that others see Jesus in us and also become recipients of your marvelous grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.